All right, guys. A couple of prayer requests before we start, and then we'll get into God's word. Number one, if you don't, uh, if you don't know, just keep uh, Sharon Brown in your prayers. She is still recovering from uh, just that back surgery and just uh, low sodium levels. It's, it's, she's getting better, but just, uh, uh, just keep her in prayer and just that uh, the Lord just heals her up. She's back in the hospital. And then uh, pray for Dale Henderson. He, uh, his surgery was a success. Everything went well, uh, but uh, they're just still uh, just watching everything and he's perking up and just keeping an eye on everything. So bless, uh, just pray, ask that the Lord blesses him and Debbie and that uh, the Lord just takes those two saints through everything. Amen. So let's uh, pray right now and then we'll get into God's word. Dear Father, we just come before you and we just thank you so much for the ministry of prayer. And we ask right now that you would just be with these saints that are in the hospital right now. Be with Sharon Brown, Lord. Just keep on healing her body. Make her 100%, Lord, by your hand. Not by the hand of doctors, but by your hand. And Lord, we lift up Dale that you just bless him. Heal him up, Lord. We thank you for medicine that they could do much. But Lord, nothing is like you. Only you could heal perfectly. And so, Father, we ask that you would do the work, that it be miracles and testimonies of your greatness, and just speak to their heart. Give them a peace that passes understanding. Just strengthen them in all things. Let them be considered a mission field as they are in that hospital bed to declare your glory amongst the people. And, Father, right now, we ask that you would just be with us as we get into your word right now. That these things, as we begin to climb up the, these, uh, these mountainous passages of, that are just so lofty, Lord, we understand our unworthiness to touch your scripture, to touch your face, Lord, to hear your word. But we ask that you, Lord, by your grace, would speak to us through them. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In your holy name, amen. Hebrews. Well, we, lo we learned last week that Hebrews we, uh, was written, we're not sure by who, but we think it's Paul. We think Paul wrote it in Hebrew to Hebrew Christians in Jerusalem. And then, of course, it was translated into Greek by the hand of Luke. That's a guess, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it's a good one. Uh, but but uh, we're not sure who wrote it, but whoever wrote it is writing to Jewish Christians who are in danger about going back to this world of Judaism, to this world of works righteousness. And uh, whoever is writing Hebrews is saying, hey, hold fast. Don't go back. Keep going. It's a strong, and, and the, the way to do that is that we're going to focus on Jesus Christ. We're going to focus on Jesus, our Messiah. And he, in this book, he's going to use words like better than. He's better. You're going to use see words like, let us therefore. There's movement of keep going forward. There's words like maturity or perfection. We got to grow up. There's warnings. There's around five warnings in the book of Hebrews where he says, watch out. Don't go there. And then also we notice how lofty it is. It's a heavenly book. Talking about not just this physical world we live in, but this book literally t teaches us that it's a spiritual life we are living in the heavenlies. It's eternal. It's forever. And then lastly, how are we going to live it? And he brings up that beautiful topic of faith. Or you want to live it by, by and through, by grace through faith. Faith, faith, faith. Believe in the Lord. Believe. Trust in him. And so that was what we learned last week. Well, here comes Hebrews chapter 1. Are you ready, guys? Buckle up. Verse 1, chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the whole worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we'll stop right there. Well, here we go. <laughs> As you know, the scriptures, the New Testament, are written in Greek. Greek gives us a little bit of a deeper explanation on these wonderful passages. 
And when you read in the Greek, it's different than the English. In the English, it starts off with the name of God. God. But in the Greek, it's different. Verse 1 of chapter 1 reads like this. At various times, in various ways, in time past, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. So God isn't the first word here. In English, they want, and, and, and English kind of does it a disservice because the English language puts God in the front, but really, he wants us to know, listen, he, he wants us to first focus on this at various times, in various ways, in time past. What does that mean? At various times, there are different seasons. In all these different seasons, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. What times is he talking about? He's talking about Old Testament days, these seasons of time back in the Old Testament days. Oh, the, talk about a roller coaster of emotions during the Jewish histories. If you are with us on midweek Bible study, which I encourage you all to show up or listen to it online, when you receive the Jewish histories, you'll see that there are ups and downs. There are side to sides. It's like a roller coaster that's off its hinges at times. But yet God has working it all out. There's good times, there's bad times, there's scary times, there's war, there's peace, there's rebellion, there's obedience, it's different seasons. Those are the various times that, that he's referring to here. Those are the various times. And he says also in various ways. Those are different methods. Different methods in time past. Those are the Old Testament days. God spoke to the fathers. Who are the fathers? The fathers are not the Christian fathers. They are the Jewish fathers of the faith. These are the, the children of Israel. He spoke to the children of Israel. Those Hebrew Christians, those Jewish ancestors, God spoke at various times, in various ways, in different ways, in Old Testament days. And God spoke by the prophets. Now, I don't know if you've read your Bible all the way through, but there's this thing called the Old Testament. And the Old Testament has all these prophets in it. And some people bag on the prophets. They go, oh, they're so boring. Well, this, listen, the prophets were the mouthpiece of God. The bullhorn of God to a whole nation, a people group. Hey, get this. This is what I say. When we talk about the prophets, so often people think of, 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 for, uh, of foretelling of the future. Oh, such and such is going to happen at such and such a time. Well, prophets did do that. They did predict the future. But their major ministry was to speak God's word. That's what a prophet does. It's a mouthpiece for the Lord. And it's funny because in Hebrews here, the Greek exclusively says, uh, the Greek says exclusively through the prophets. He spoke, he chose the prophets God did back in Old Testament days to speak to the people. And man, God did speak to Israel. It says that Moses was a prophet, a man who was a prophet of God. And in good times, in little uncertain times, God spoke through Moses. And, and, and you know what the, it says in various ways. You know what the ways that, what, with Moses, it was through a mountaintop experience. Through a mountaintop. He went up to the mountaintop and God spoke through Moses from the mountaintop. With David, it was through the ways of the Psalms. Elijah, by fire. Elisha, by miracles. Isaiah had visions as, long, as well as Ezekiel. Jeremiah, God spoke to the people through Jeremiah through the means of illustrations. He, he would make little models. He would, he would wear certain, he would do certain things and wear certain things. And, and God spoke through uh, Jeremiah to the people through illustrations. God spoke to, through the prophet Daniel by dreams. Hosea, God spoke to the people through Hosea through his marriage. He said, Hosea, I want you to go marry a prostitute and take her as your own. Love her. And then live life. And boy, it was an illustration of uh, and she wasn't faithful. <laughs> she did not remain faithful to her husband. And it was an illustration of the nation of Israel not 
being faithful unto God. And, he, and God spoke to the nation of Israel through his marriage. The prophet Joel, God spoke through locusts. Amos by an earthquake. Jonah through a fish. Micah was through his nakedness. God said, hey, be naked at a t as, for a time. Walk around naked so that uh, it will be an illustration of how they will take you away naked into Babylon. Habakkuk, by questions, he questioned God. Zechariah, by signs and wonders. And then the last prophet, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, by baptism and just his voice. He was loud. A voice crying in the wilderness. Now notice this, guys. All different men, all different seasons of times, all at different times and different ways. And this is the thing, all on topic. Every single one of them was on point. They never contradicted each other over a 1,000 some year time period. They never once contradicted. They were all on topic, on point, and they pointed to one person, and that's the Lord. And the aspects of who God is, what he does, his coming. So this isn't a rejection of these Old Testament prophets. It's really a celebration in verse 1 of who they are and what they did. And, and we should be in awe of the Old Testament. Guys, if you don't know the Old Testament, how can you know the new? And if you don't know the new, how can you understand the old? They both go together. But look at verse 2. Has in these last days, so God has spoken by these guys, these prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. In these last days. <laughs> He's spoken to us by his son in these last days. Do you know when Jesus started to speak? It's around 31 A.D. And he says that, if you take this verse as face value, that was the beginning of the last days. We always think, oh, when did the last days start? Oh, it started with the current geopolitical situation. These are the last days. Oh, we're in the last days. But the, the last days have been cooking since Jesus came around and began to speak, according to this verse. He's coming soon. And, the, and these are the last days. And... and, and you're like, well, uh, you know, he hasn't come in a thousand, some year, two thousand years. Does that mean that he's never going to come? No, no. It just means that we are in the last, 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 last days. <laughs> we're, we're coming up close. Things are getting hot and heavy. If you watch the news this morning, holy mackerel. The president of Iran has just died with all of his top cronies in a helicopter accident. They're blaming the Jews for it. And so, because it was three helicopters one crashed with all the important people on it. The other two made it in bad weather. Uh, and so we're just waiting to see what happens. Uh, they've been bombing all morning, Israel, from, uh, from their proxies from the north. So we'll see how it goes. But uh, uh, it, it's, something's going to happen. Uh, but um, just, you know, Iran is moving. Watch it. And so with that said, it's another sign of the times. Of course we're living in the last days. But in these last days, since Jesus has shown up, he has spoken, it says, now notice what it says here, by his son. Now that's Jesus Christ. But in the Greek, and I, it's a poor translation here, I'm sorry. And you could just put a little circle on the word by, B-Y, and put a little circle, draw a little line to the side, and put the word in. It's not by his son, it's in his son. In the son, in him, God has spoken. What does that mean, Pastor Andrew? Jesus isn't like the prophets. What's the number one word of Hebrews? Better. Better. Here's your first better than. Jesus is better than the prophets. And he just wants to lay that out there. The author of Hebrews just wants to lay it out there that Jesus is better than the prophets. And so he says it like this. He says, he hasn't spoken by the prophets, but he has spoken in his son. The literal translation there means that Jesus is the voice of God. That he literally is that which is being spoken of by God the Father. Jesus isn't like the prophets. Jesus is better. 
<coughs> Jesus isn't just speaking forth God's word, which we know he does. In John chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, he says, I speak, the words that I speak are from the Father. So yes, he was speaking forth the words of Father God, but there's more. He's not just speaking God's word, he is God's word. He is the word. John chapter 1, verse 1 says it really cool. And John 1, speaking of the Lord, it says, in the beginning was the word. That word there is logos, the thinker behind the thought. You know, you know what you mean, right? Thinker behind, you, you. the person who, um, this is a very interesting, deep word in the Greek language. In the beginning was the logos, the word. Logos is the thinker behind the thought. That means it's like the guy who thinks the thought, you know what, I want to build a house. So he has thought the thought. He's the thinker of the thought. He is the creator, the thinker of it. That's the word that's being used there. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Just showing how he is God. And he's also a separate part of the Trinity. He's with God and is God at the same time. Now, don't, I don't want to get, that's a big topic, of the, but the Trinity is a gorgeous, beautiful thing, but it's there. All three are separate individuals, yet all at the same time, one, but at the same time, separate. How is that possible? I don't know. But it's there. I can see it. I, don't, I can't run blood tests. I can't get forensic. But I know the evidence that is there. Three distinct persons, completely different than each other, but yet at the same time, at all time, are still one God. This is something that we don't got cooking here. Well, isn't it like water, H2O? There's one H2O and it shows itself in, it shows itself in water, in steam, and in solid. That's a good illustration, but this is the thing. It fails. Because that molecule can only be one at any given time. God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the same time. You're like, man, I got a headache, Andrew. I need more coffee. I, I need more coffee for this. It's too early. Talk to me after one. But that's the Trinity. And he says, he, and so God the Father is speaking, not by his Son, in his Son. And it's just an amazing thing. John 14, 9, same thing he says. We'll get back to that verse in a little bit. But Jesus isn't just God's mouthpiece or prophet. He is God's word. Not by, but in. His very person, Jesus' very life, is the message of God to humanity. How is Jesus better than the prophets? Well, then he begins to explain why he's better than the prophets. He says this. <clears throat> he is the appointed heir whom he, has, God the Father, has appointed heir of all things. Now, that means an heir. He's, an, he's going to be an inheritor. Jesus inherits something. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, All things were created through him and for him. He gets everything. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things. So Jesus is the heir. He's the inheritor of all things. Everything that belongs to God, Jesus has. Isn't that amazing? He has everything God has. And that's who he is. And, and can a prophet say that? Can Isaiah say that about himself? Can uh, Jeremiah? Can Daniel? No. But Jesus is the sole beneficiary of everything that God has. God has given it to his son. And this is the neat thing. And this is what you want your mind just to melt. Here it is. You and I, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through salvation, are joint heirs with Christ. We are part of it. He's brought us in. 
we abide in Christ. Therefore, Ephesians tells us that we have been brought in and we are heirs as well. We inherit it with Jesus. Everything that God has is given to Jesus. And guess what? Jesus shares it with us. We are heirs as well. And Paul says it best. He goes, well, then if, something, if you're going to get an inheritance, what had to die? And he goes, Jesus died on the cross. He died and we inherited through his death. How great is that? He brings us in. At Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just share a couple of passages with you. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18, it says this. The, uh, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. He wants us to know that we are inheritors with Christ. Because Jesus has inherited everything, we do too. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, says this. Talking about, well, let's start with verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So we have been adopted into the family of God. God is our Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we are joint heirs. Everything God has is given to Jesus. Everything God is, Jesus receives. All things, his glory, his power, everything that God has, he has everything. Jesus has, and we are brought in by the cross. That's why Jesus is better than a prophet. You can look, oh, the prophets, the prophets, the prophets, the ancient Jews of old would say, oh, the prophet. Well, we are, and, and the author of Hebrews is saying, hey, there's someone better than the prophets. Why? Because he inherits everything. The prophets would, could just at best speak of the inheritance. They could talk about it. They could declare it. But Jesus is the inheritor. He's the beneficiary. And then we're brought in. Praise the Lord. Have you enjoyed your inheritance today? Have you recognized it and then relished in it? Have you said, oh, I just thank you, God, that I have everything that I ever needed in life. It's found in you. I have everything I need in you. I have received everything from you, and I am just fine in you. Have you done that today? That's your inheritance. And it's not just an inheritance for now. It's a spiritual inheritance for all time. How great is that? Amen? Re recognize it. Dive into that inheritance and discover the depths of it. The love, the grace, the goodness, the kindness, the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Number two, look what else it says in, back in Hebrews. It says that, he, that Jesus was appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Huh? I thought God made the heavens and the earth. Yeah, and Jesus is God. But it's through whom, through Jesus, God made the worlds. He is not just the inheritor, he is the creator. He's the creator. And it, worlds, it's like, oh, the planets. No, no, no. It's more than planets. The word there is I own in the Greek, which means everything. If you turn back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In that passage, you see time, space, and matter. In the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. You see all the three basic building blocks of everything that we know in, our, in the galaxies and the universes. And that is that word, I own, the world is not just planets or the earth. It's so much more. It's everything that's out there. He created it all. 
In John 3, one, uh, in jo sorry, in John chapter 1, he says the same thing, declaring that Jesus, the Logos, is the creator. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Wow, that's pretty blunt and bold. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, same thing. It says this, it says, for by him all things, that means Jesus, for by Jesus all things are created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, that means the whole angelic world, all things were created through him and for him. So Jesus is the creator of all things. Did, did Jeremiah, the prophet, create anything? Oh, he, he made these little models of Jerusalem and, and he played with them to show the destruction of Jerusalem. Did, did Daniel? No, no, no. He just, he, he had a little, uh, you know what he created? He created a little uh, slumber party with lions, you know, and but, but Jesus is better. He's the creator. He's the creator of all things. And then in verse 3 it says, who being the brightness of his glory... Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. He's not just the inheritor. He's not just the creator. He's the radiator. He radiates God's glory. What does that mean? He's not a reflection of God's glory. Don't think that he's a reflection. He, the moon reflects the light of the sun to us, right? He's not like the moon. He actually is, and he's not... Uh, you know, when we look at the sun and, you know, we get all Einstein-y and uh, we think of the rays of sun, the photons coming at us, these rays of light. He's not that either. He's the brightness of his glory. He's not the reflection of God's glory. He is God's glory. That's who Jesus is. Moses asked to see God's glory. He says, oh, Lord, show me your glory. Show me you. I want to see you. Show me your glory. He goes, you can't see it. You'll, you'll melt. Well, you didn't say melt, but you'll, you'll die. No man has seen God and die. But he says, you, you, he says, you want to see, and he says, go into the cleft of the rock. Hide your face. I'm going to move past you, and you can see the, 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 the shining forth, the afterglow. You can just see the glow of the glory. Just the glow of the glory. And when Moses saw that, it says that he actually, he reflected, he shined forth what just the glow of the glory, the afterglow. But this is the thing. Jesus is the glory of God. We see this in the Mount of Transfiguration when he goes up to a high mountain and he transfigures and he shines forth brighter than the sun. And they were in shock, the disciples were. Revelation chapter 1 has a detailed description of the glorified Christ. In, in chapter 4 or 5, you see him as the lamb that's slaughtered with scars and everything. But in chapter 1, you see him with a sword coming out of his mouth. Eyes like flame of fire, feet like brass, clothed in white, shining brighter than the sun. The glorified Christ. But he is the glory of God. He's it. His glory, not our glory. You know, I love this. Because Jesus is the brightness of his glory, because he's actually the radiance of God, he shines forth. The glory of God is Jesus himself. According to this scripture, because of that, guess what? It just puts my glory in check. I, got, I, ain't, I ain't got no glory. I have nothing to glorify in myself, you know? You know, like, look at how great I am. No, who? What? No. You're not even close, Andrew. You guys can be very successful. You can glory in a lot of things and boast in a lot of things. But our glory is just junk. Remember when you and I used to play Little League and uh, soccer or some type of sports as a kid? And they would give us, guess what, trophies, right? 
in high school, I got a letterman's jacket for being on the football team. And you gloried in that. You walked around. You kept it clean. You showed it off. And you're like, yeah, look at my trophy. Look at my glory. Where is that glory now? It's collecting dust in the closet. It's got holes. It's cruddy. It's my jacket's all yeah. It's just, it's just, it's not glorious anymore. The trophies are in a box in my mom's garage. That's a scary place. No more glory. My glory is junk. Our glory is horrible. And every laurel, every uh, lotting, every glory that we have from the world, from man, the glory of man, the glory of ourselves, that will pass away in time. But Jesus is the glory of God. And if you want to be around glorious things, I like glorious things. I like to be around glorious things. You know, when you go up to the uh, Sierras, and you go up there and you see just those beautiful mountains, and you're just basking in the glory of nature, and really the glory of God, he, he created it and it declares the glory of God. And, and, there, and it's just beautiful up there. You go to Convict Lake, or you go up to the to, the, to um, Devil's Post Piles. You go up to the to Mount Whitney, and you're just just or Yosemite or Sequoia, and you're like, "Good grief! We live in the best state ever. I love California. It, it, like this is the glorious and the grandeur of of the of the beauty there. You go to the coast, and you look at the at the waves crashing. And you're like, man, glorious." But this is nature. It will fail someday. Everything will burn up. It all burns. It could be taken away in a flash. The glory of Yosemite Valley can be wiped away with just one match. That's how frail it is. How sad. It could be all ruined by one earthquake. All gone. But God's glory always is there. And what's his glory? Jesus Christ. It will never diminish. Therefore, let's focus on that. Let's focus on that. Let's, let's bathe in that glory. The next thing that it says here is that, that it, it, he's also, in, uh, it says, uh, who being the brightness of his glory, and, oh, here we go, and the express image of his person, Jesus is the express image of his person. He's not just, a, he's a representer. He represents, he's the express image of his person. If you want to, look, turn to John 14, verse 9. In John 14, verse 9, Philip is there. And he says, if you've known me, you have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to Jesus, one of his disciples, Lord, show us the father and it will be sufficient for us. It will be cool if we could just see God. And Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but my Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. The express image of God Show us the Father, Lord. Show us the Father, Jesus. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the expressed image of the Lord. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Same thing. He says, He is, Jesus is, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So He is the expressed image. We, when we look at Jesus, we see God. That's who he is. He's the express engraved image of who God is, the invisible God. And not just that, look back at Hebrews. Here's the next thing. It says, and that's the thing. That's why he's better than the prophets. Because he's better than the prophets because the prophets could just speak about God. Jesus 
literally shows God. He's the image of who God is. You want to see who God is? Look at Jesus. Greater than the prophets. And then next it says, upholding. He is the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He is the sustainer of all things. I love this about the Lord. Jesus, it says that he's the creator of heaven and earth, but he also is the, is the sustainer. It's like he's the logos. He's the thinker of the thought. And now he's the creator, the guy who makes the thoughts. He creates all things by the word of his mouth. And not just that, then he becomes not just the thinker, the planner, the designer. Then he becomes the contractor. He builds it. And not just he builds it, he then becomes the janitor. He keeps it up. He keeps all things up. That's what he does. He does it all. He made it and sustains it. In Colossians chapter 1, we've read it already. For by him all things are created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created through him and for him. Now get this. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. They're held together. They're held together by Jesus. He holds it together. He's the sustainer. He willed it, and by the power of his word, he made it. And by the power of his might, he'll keep it. Wow. That's what Jesus does. Better than a prophet. Better than those Old Testament prophets, guys. But he holds everything together. Theoretical physicists say that the world is held together by something called dark matter. And when you ask that theoretical physicist what dark matter is, they're not sure. It, it, goes against, it goes against everything scientific that we know. That why isn't an atom splitting apart? All atoms are held together, but by scientific rule, they're supposed to all split apart. And, and we know what happens when you split apart an atom, right? You have an atom bomb. So one atom splitting together, chain reaction, you have an atomic explosion. That's the power of those little tiny basic principles. And the Bible says, we know what dark matter is. It's the Lord. He's holding it together. Everything. And so when you see one little atom be let go, that's God saying, all right, I'll let it happen. Boom. Power of God. Crazy. That power on earth. But he's holding it all together by the, and I love this, by the power of his word. He just says, hold, hold, don't let go. And there is going to come a day that says that the Lord will let go of everything. The Bible says, and everything will be burnt up with unquenchable fire. Wow. But he sustains it. Better than the prophets. He's a sustainer. But this is the thing. If he can hold everything together in this planet, don't you think that he's going to hold together your life? Is your life falling apart? Is your life, you're like, man, I feel like my whole life is Hiroshima. I feel like my whole life is an atomic bomb. I feel like my whole life is, is falling apart. Oh, go to Jesus. He holds all things together. He's the sustainer. If he could do that with dark matter, and that's powerful stuff, guess what? He could do that with you and your life. So never, ever think, oh, when things are falling apart, just say, oh, I need my sustainer. I need Jesus to hold it together, and he'll hold it together. Then look at what it says, the next thing that it says about Jesus. Remember, what? remember Hebrews? Big focus on Jesus, guys. This is what we're experiencing right now as we're going through. The next thing about Jesus, it says, upholds all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. <laughs> you think <laughs> that one of the greatest powerful things that Jesus can do is hold everything together. Well, he tops himself. <laughs> he tops himself. He goes, he's purged our sins by himself. What? 
That's pretty impressive. He's a, not just he's a representative and a sustainer, he's a purifier. He purifies by himself, no help. And, and the word there in the Greek, purged our sins, the word are is not there. It's not your individual sins, it's sin. He purged sin. That means when it, you take the R away, because it's not there in the Greek, and it should be not there in the English, but it is, it's not just your sin, it's sin in general. It's the whole package of what sin is. He's purged it. And it's not just a washing, it's everything that sin does, he's taking care of it at the cross. He breaks the nature of sin within your hearts, if you give him your life, if you receive his grace and believe in him through faith, faith and confess your sins. He breaks the very nature of sin. He gives you a new nature. The guilt of sin. The Lord Jesus takes away the guilt of sin. The, the, the things that you've done in the past that you feel guilty about, he can remove that. He takes away the penalty of sin, which is death and hell. He takes that away. It gives us life. He brings us to God. He bridges the gap. Sin has separated us, separated us from God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he purges, and then he brings us into the presence of God. He gives us peace. He brings us back to God. He takes away our unrighteousness and gives us his righteousness. That's what it means. He delivers us from any type of bondage that we may have because of sin. He does wash. He cleanses away the perversion. He molds us into the image of Christ. And, he, and we will be with the Lord forever when we die or get raptured. That's, that's salvation as well. That's the whole thing of what Jesus has done. That's what he's done for us. He's the purifier. He's purged sin. The whole package deal. That's what Jesus has done for us. That's who he is. And then lastly, it says, sat down at the right hand of the majesty, who is God the Father, on high. He is seated at the right hand of God. Seated means that his job is done. He is those things, but get this, his job is finished. And he's just seated. He just seat, take a seat, Lord, right at the right hand of the Father. And this is the cool thing. He's there, and he's seated as ruler, but he also takes the position of advocate for you. He pleads your case before a, an accusing Satan who is accusing you night and day before the throne of God. He's your lawyer. He's your advocate. And he is seated at the right hand of God. The Levites and the prophets, those guys stood Prophets stood and preached God's word. Priests were in the tabernacle serving nonstop. They never sat. Jesus has entered into the presence of God and has sat down as your advocate. When he is your advocate, he doesn't even rise to take your defense. He just, hey, guess what? He, 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 and he shows them the nail scars. That one's mine. Covered in the blood. Covered in my righteousness. The spirit dwells in him or her. So you see, Jesus is better than the prophets. In these three verses, he just lays it all out, straight up. And he's the voice of God. He's all these things right here. That's just who Jesus is. And so if you ever doubt like, who he is and what he's done for you, I just love this passage. He, he's the inheritor. He's the creator. He's the radiator of the glory of God. He's the representer of God, the sustainer, the purifier, the ruler. That's who he is. And this is just the first three verses. <laughs> but I want to let you guys know, have you come to know Jesus better today because of these three verses? This is who he is. And this is what he's done for us. I, too, am going to inherit everything because I'm abiding in Christ. I've been purchased by him. I, he's the creator of all things. Therefore, he's all-powerful. He's going to take care of me. 
He's the very glory of God. Therefore, I'm going to hang on to his glory and not my glory that fades away. He's the representative of who God is, the express image of who God is. Therefore, if I'm ever needing to see the face of God, I just need Jesus. He sustains me. He pur purifies sin. We are totally taken care of. And he's my ruler sitting at the right hand of God. That's Jesus. Do you have Jesus today? Hopefully you haven't been holding on to a prophet. Hopefully, and he's not dogging on the prophets. He's saying he's better than the prophets. Those prophets are good. They were great. They did God's work. But Jewish people, back in the day, he said, don't, don't rely too much on them because what they talked about, Jesus is. How great is that? That's who Jesus is. And you know what? They're, in our lives as Christians, as American Christians and Gentile Christians, guess what? There's a lot of prophets that we could hang ourselves upon. That we get obsessed about people who speak for God, pastors or teachers. Did you hear Pastor so and so? Did you hear Pastor Andrew? Did you hear Pastor what? This other person? I don't know. And, and you, we get obsessed with people who speak for God. Don't get obsessed with pastors, with people who speak for God and God's word. Always focus on Jesus. It's the job of every pastor to point to Jesus. Yes, I may be the pastor, which means shepherd of this congregation at Calvary Chapel, Long Beach, but it's all about Jesus. He's the head guy. He's the one that runs things here. He's it. And this is the beautiful thing. Never get hung up on anyone. Anyone except Jesus Christ. He's everything. He's better than any spokesman on this planet. Jesus is it. Don't be, don't get obsessed with anybody or anything. We, we get that way, don't we, guys? It might be a politician. It might be a newfangled thing. Uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> people always say, Andrew, you got to go on this carnivore diet. You know, Darren was telling me the other day about the carnivore diet, and I said, hey, I was really thinking about it. But then as I do dove in, and it wasn't, wasn't people from the church, but there, there's people online I was observing, and it's a god to them. If you're not in the carnivore diet, you're missing out on life. I'm just like, geez, Louise. It's just, it's just steak and chicken, dude. Just calm down. You know, like, good Lord. You know, these guys are just like, you know, it's like, it's just a diet, man. You're probably going to gain it back when the ice cream truck comes down the street, you know? It, it's like, gosh, duh. And they obsess about these things. And there are certain things that we obsess with. Uh, it could be a pastor. It could be a lifestyle ch choice. It could be, uh, you know, a, a, a hobby. It could be something that we, we oh, oh, this is the thing. Oh, no, no, no. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. And we, we saw seven things here about what he does, who he is, what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do. I want Jesus. It's the best thing that we can do. He's better than the prophets. He's better than anything that could speak to our heart. He's the better thing. And he's letting us know that here. I encourage you to enjoy the better thing. I encourage you to enjoy the fact that your Savior is seated in the presence of God, that he has purified, that he has purged sin. Enjoy the sustaining aspect that Jesus has given us in our life today. Enjoy how he is the image of God, and we never have questions on who God is, but they're all answered in Christ. Enjoy the fact that he is the glory of God. Enjoy the fact that he's the creator. Worship him as such. And enjoy the fact that he has given us, and through him, we have an inheritance from the Father. Just enjoy it. Enjoy Jesus. He's better. He's better. He's doggone better. And just enjoy it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for being better. Thank you, Father, for giving us a better prophet, a better thing. The prophets spoke of the word, 
but we have the word. Thank you, Jesus. We ask that you would just move, teach us these things, grow us in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, guys. Have a great rest of the day. But just really, hey, let this bother you. Let it be just a spiritual splinter in your brain. Uh, just to, man, thank you, Lord, for being better. Uh, if you think that you got it made, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I got it all together. I got something really cool. Jesus is better. And just, just soak it in. It's the whole essence of Hebrews. Jesus loves you. I love you. He's coming back soon. And uh, we will see you later, guys. God bless. Let's worship the Lord.